Hello, I'm Nicholas Coleridge. I'm chairman of the Campaign for Wool. And I'm speaking this morning to Ian McLean, who's chief executive of John Smedley, which is, of course, one of the great, long-established heritage wool heroes of the United Kingdom and the world. And also Chloe Cooper, who also works at Smedley. And we are going to be talking this morning about wool, sustainability, a particularly marvelous jersey, which has just been made by John Smedley, um, using wool from flocks on the, Prince of, uh, on the Prince of Wales's estate. The estate, actually, we should say, um, the campaign, we should say, is now, of course, uh, our patron is King Charles III, but the duchy has moved to the new Prince of Wales, a.k.a. Prince William. Um, now we've got over that um, complexity, yeah. we, can, we can move on. Ian, the last time I spoke to you, I reckon, was two years ago in your shop in German Street. And at the time, I think we were just coming out of COVID, yeah. or were we just about to go into it, or were we in COVID? Well, there was an interlude. We were, in we were in the intermission, actually, all right. We've gone on as, uh, with several sequels, uh, which haven't been that pleasant, but we, we seem to have come through, I think, that... Definitely the worst of it now. So. Well, last night, as you know, we were all here at Five Savile Row, where we're sitting this morning, where we were celebrating the start of what is now called Wool Month, mm. which tries to promote the use of wool in as many different forms as we can think of. We have fashion, we have carpets, we have insulation, we have innovation, which has become rather an important mm. uh, new part. I always think with John Smedley that you're rather interesting because you take wool from the other side of the world, but also increasingly you're using British wool and very particular British wool. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I think, I think it, is, it is a challenge. Um, the wool that we normally source uh, is from New Zealand. We've been doing that for, for over 25 years from specific farms, mm -hmm. and that allows the New Zealand farmers, you know, on those kind of long-term relationship, long-term contracts, to invest in their flocks and breed the dynamics of the fiber that we need for a very fine garment. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this year and this project in the last year, um, which came about as a result of um, being awarded the Prince of Wales's Royal Warrant, uh, before he came king, so over many a year congratulations ago. on that. Thank they don't hand them out that easily. So good. I, I, in, in sort of celebration of that um, great event, I thought uh, that I would very much like to be able to create um, a wool jumper or product using wool from the Duchy estates, from sheep on the Duchy estates. And I wasn't sure, actually, at the time that that had ever been done before, or actually how challenging a project it might be. But I thought, you know, to celebrate that, uh, to getting the Royal Warrant, it was probably the right thing to do. Tell us how you started. Did you go to the Duchy and say that you would like introductions to different farms on Exmoor and Tiverton, etc. We did. We didn't really know who to approach initially. Yeah. And, uh, well, Chloe, do you want to say, because eventually we started talking to a spinner who was located in Cornwall. Yes, so we had an existing relationship um, with this spinner from a previous project. And um, I think the team back at the mill, Jess and Pip, the head designer, having that relationship built up, got in touch with the natural fibre company who are down in Cornwall and spoke to them about the project and they were able to use their contacts like in the local area to really reach out to the farmers that could be involved and see what fleeces could even be available to us because at that point we just weren't even sure of the um, type of wool that we could even get from the various farms on the estate. So we were really lucky to work with the natural fibre company and their experience there in sourcing the fibres. Was it difficult to get the fibres in the end? Because this, I'm reaching over <laughs> as we speak and feeling this incredibly... It, it's, it's softer than you'd think, isn't it? It's, uh, it's considerably it's, softer yeah. than you would think. And yet it has this very, very attractive ribbed design. Mm. It's kind of a classic, but it's, yeah. it's frightfully cool. If you wore that with a pair of jeans, I think it would look very, I, very cool. I think what we found was that, that 
talking to an actual fiber company who are the spinners mm. uh, and had some of the relationships with the farms, mm. was that we, 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 we and they were kind of cutting across a process that would have made it very difficult to, us to acquire the fiber because um, all farmers just um, sell the, their output of um, wool fiber into the marketplace and it kind of disappears into an enormous sort of spinning morass and they never see it again. They never see the end product. They never have a relationship with, I don't know, the manufacturer or the designer. Yes. It's just however many pence per fleece that they can get and the wool disappears. So we were cutting right across that yeah. to talk to very specific farms who had specific sheep breeds on them and, and creating almost an entirely new conversation that, that I don't think they'd ever had before, had they? Who visited them first? Did you? So I haven't visited the farms this time. Um, I think the, it was really the kind of working with the natural fiber company yep. and the kind of middleman and engaging us in that conversation. And then hopefully as the project kind of develops and continues over the years, we'll just continue to build those relationships with the farmers themselves and kind of see hopefully the impact of smaller projects like this and what that can have mm. for the British school. Do you know the names of the farmers from whom this came somewhere in the some system. Of them, some of them know, they yeah. probably do at your intermediary, yeah, don't yeah, they? They would do, know yeah. them all. And I what is it easy to buy, uh, as you did, um, as it were, at one remove from the farmers? Because there's always been a thing where a lot of the wool goes up to Bradford, yes. where the British Wool yeah. Board auctions it, yeah. and then, in, but you've in a way, through your spinner, yes. found a way to be able to use this very high quality soft wool yes. and then to make it to move and it we to met, your own. We met the th three, far three farms, three farmers, and I think yeah. what's interesting, of course, about wool is every year you get a new crop. So yes. we've gone through a, a massive learning process just to produce this one for the first time round, and we acquired enough uh, fiber to, to produce 150 jumpers, but from three different uh, sheep and three different farms. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, Chloe, you're, you're thinking that as the next crop comes through, we may be able to just go to one farm. I think, I don't, I'm not 100% sure if it's one farm, but I think um, it's this year's crop, which will become next year's jumper, and we found actually that obviously the farms that we're working with, they've changed their crops in that time, and maybe there's been something that's affected the yield. So we are looking at actually possibly only using one type of fibre, where this time we've got a blend of three. You and used so three breeds yes. this time, didn't you, I yes. saw? So Can you, are you clever enough to remember what the three <laughs> are? <laughs> so we have, um, it's a 60% Dorset and 40% Juliet split mm -hmm. in the yarn, and the Dorset is made up of Dorset down and whole Dorset fleece. Yeah. Um, where next year that will probably change a bit, we're able to kind of react to the yield that is from that year, and so we can be quite flexible and really each year develop the best product for that year's sheep. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really, really interesting to see kind of how things can change over the years and how we can kind of work with the spinners and the farmers to ensure we're always developing kind of the best product for that year. I think it's incredibly appealing to consumers, don't you, to know, have some idea of where the wool yes. came from. In the same way that the, I don't think there are quite so many now, but there used to be various steak restaurants I used to go to that used to always put in bracket the name of the farm yes. or the name of the estate yes. it came from. I think they've now stopped doing that yeah. because people don't like to be reminded that steak comes from animals. <laughs> but with sheep, I don't think there's any such problem. In fact, no. it makes it, it, makes it um, very appealing, I think, to, to have a sense of that connection yeah. to the countryside when you're... Well, and the consumer, we find, is playing an increasingly important part in this process of thinking about sustainability, which this yes. project, you know, it, it sort of encapsulates so many elements of that. Mm -hmm. But the consumer uh, does want to know where their garments are ma made, mm -hmm. doesn't want to know how they're made and what they're made of. Mm -hmm. And that, that, is, that is the end point of the supply chain. But all the way through, back from the consumer to the manufacturer, well, the designer mm. and the manufacturer like ourselves, mm. through to the spinner who are behind us, right back to the farm now, mm. everybody is beginning to think in the same, in the same way that mm. we have to react to this changing attitude towards garments. I mean, we're in the garment industry, mm. obviously there mm. are many other industries that need to do the same, but in the garment industry it's all about 
understanding the raw materials and their impact on the environment and can we reduce that mm. and then all the way through the chain everybody is thinking about how to make things better and make more, more sustainable which of course the patron of, of, of the campaign has been as we know talking about since when the 1970s I think he absolutely has and he started talking about it yes there were some very very early speeches of him um, speaking about um, the environmental imperative of mm of farming and all way related, ahead of his time, way ahead yeah. of his time. Yeah. but he started talking about sheep for those who are listening who don't know about the campaign for wool it started 14 years ago when he gave a dinner in Clarence House in London and he invited quite an assortment of different people there were some mm. sheep farmers there were some people from the sheep boards um, there were um, there were some designers and a couple of um, tailors from Savile Row and I went to it, I think, representing the fashion industry in those days. And that was the very first time that I'd heard the now king talking about sustainability um, in the world of wool. I mean, you guys um, at John Smedley have always been the good guys in this, in this matter. But I don't think I'd quite realized quite how many, how many clothes were going, garments of all kinds mm. were going to landfill. Yes. Um, I, I literally, I, it had somehow passed me by mm, mm. that s such a high percentage were being made of oil-based synthetics. And the king spoke very, very passionately about it. And he raised the question that when a, um, a, a shirt that's made of um, a synthetic um, ends its life, mm. which is sometimes very, very quick, yeah. because as we well know, for a lot of the c companies, should we name, why don't we name them? <laughs> Boohoo and others mm. make clothes that are going to be bought to be worn twice mm. by some young woman in Liverpool to mm. go out to a club mm. and then she, after it's worn once or twice, doesn't wear it again. Mm. It then goes to landfill. Yeah. It then ends up from a dustbin going into the earth where they cover it, as we know, with a very thin layer of earth. And underneath, these clothes don't rot, no. they don't biodegrade. Mm. Our people, archaeologists in the future, mm. are going to be able to dig them up mm. and they're going to be able to pull out and say, look, mm. here is an amazing top shop shirt mm. I was worn by an English woman <laughs> 600 years ago in, <laughs> in <laughs> the 1990s. Yeah. Um, and he was the person who really got it going. Mm. But the world is rather played in all our direction, I think, since then, since mm. the people are so enormously caught up with the idea of sustainability, mm. um, that I think that we really have seen something of a turning point, mm. and that people would rather buy one of these expensive, but not unfairly mm. so, jerseys that you could wear I suspect you could wear that for 25 years yes. if you looked after, looked after it easily. It. Probably yeah. pass it on to somebody else. And I else. think he, he was highlighting, I think, a couple of points at that time. One was you know, the loss of the link between the consumer and the understanding of where their products came from and the, con the resulting effect on the farmer where the demand for wool was so low that they couldn't get any value for it um, in, in the marketplace. So, so I think his concern was, you know, how do we create more value for the farmer to create better sheep that and was better wool? And that was the very starting point, wasn't it? It was, it was, and it, it was. And it's making those links, it's, it's rebuilding those links between consumers and the farmers that, that will create the value, that will recreate the industry, is what I believe. And this, yeah. this project, project begins to show that, where you open yeah. up the box, you talk about the spinner and the business in Cornwall, which employs yes. maybe more than 20 people in this country. Yes. And then all of the farms around that, yes. with the farmers and their families and the community, you know, yeah. it all feeds through into a product which becomes then, in the consumer's mind, I believe, more valuable than just the thing itself. Well, I was just about to use that word value. Exactly. And it's really what it is, isn't mm. it? That, um, the, uh, a very odd thing about sheep farming was that pre the Second World War, right up until 1939, if you were a sheep farmer, 50% um, of your profit used to come from the wool, and 50% of yeah. your profit used to come from the meat. Yes. Today, 
it is 99% of your profit comes wow. from the meat yeah. and 1% of your profit yeah. comes from the wool by the time you've taken off the cost of shearing. Yeah. Um, and the great tragedy 14 years ago was that the demand for wool was going down and down and down. And then it plateaued. Mm. And I wouldn't exactly say that it is spiking, but mm. it is definitely mm. on the up. Mm. And the number of people who were exiting sheep farming before the prince started his campaign yeah. was very high. Yeah. And that definitely slowed yeah. Yeah. down. Yeah. And all this innovation about using it for um, insulation and for other things mm. has allowed the top wool to be used yeah. by fashion yeah. and the slightly broader wool to be used by carpets yeah. and then all kinds of extra wool to be used for packaging yeah. and for all kinds of, yeah. of other things. Are you finding that the consumer is buying more in your shop, say, or mm. your mm. shop, sir, but let's, um, the one round the corner, um, are people buying more wool than they were? I think definitely we're seeing, we um, introduced not this British wool, but another British wool into our main collection yeah. a couple of seasons ago now, and we're definitely seeing the reaction to that increase over the seasons, and actually the understanding of it as quite a different product for mm. us, mm. but the value of that product is really growing in the market. And I think also from the other side, in terms of buying yarn, we're definitely seeing the demand for that across the industry is increasing, which yeah. is great for the industry as a whole. Um, so yeah, it's great to see, and I just think that understanding of it in the for the consumer is definitely growing. Mm. Yeah, for our exactly. business, it is quite a different. Product. And you're you're right. I mean, the, those numbers you put on the ninety ten, the ninety percent mm. coming from the from the meat and the ten yeah. percent from the wool is, you know, that there's some figures which we can work on as an industry. And I think I think it's a very interesting point you make about the the meat because I I do believe that the that the food industry, the restaurant industry, the media. You know, the British food, the growers, yeah. the locality, the branding ha has, has so radically changed in the last, last 40 years. That industry has done a brilliant job of linking the consumer back to the land. And, and in a sense, we need to do the same. And, 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 and hopefully, at that, if we can, you know, you can raise it back up to 50-50. I should clarify one thing. In Australia, of course, it's different. Yes. Where Merino... Um, wool carries a greater price and value yes. um, because it's more versatile in certain yes. situations. Yes. And, um, and, and the meat is in a country where the population is so very much smaller yes. Yes. Than, than the yes. uh, number of, of, of sheep. And I think um, the same in New, New Zealand. Well, we saw specifically from New Zealand and have done for a long time. And Of course, I, I believe they came, as an, as an agricultural industry, they came off subsidies 30 years ago, mm. so, mm. so you, you're into a free-flowing marketplace. Really, I feel that spurred great innovation in, in New Zealand. Mm. Um, ups and downs, swings and ups and downs, but it does mean that, if, that they have a very great incentive to, to make sure that Merino goes for them to keep the farms going, and, and it's a, it's a two-way street. We can work with them, and they can work with us to make it a success, and I, I think we have done over the last few years. I think people forget how many people are working in the sheep industry around mm -hmm. the world. It is in its millions. Yes. Millions. Yes. And in this country, of course, in medieval England, when sheep um, farming was um, and wool was the number one industry, yes. um, it, we all remember that time as yes. being every parish church in the country was yes. built with, yes. with wool money. But if you add up the number of people around the world who are working in wool-related businesses mm. in Japan, that huge market for, for wool, in America, yes. um, where they're taking so much. This is a, 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 a world that isn't small. Mm. People think of it as niche. It's mm. not niche mm. at all. Mm. It's, um, it's a global uh, industry. The yes. Indians, as we know, absolutely adore wool and, and yes. are great wool consumers. And China has its love on-off love affair with yes. what they do with, 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 with wool. And I think that, that global story, you know, we have to keep telling it because I don't, mm. we know in the UK that the environment and the weather and the land is capable of growing a particular type of sheep and a particular yeah. type of wool, which is okay for certain products, but not all. 
And I think, the, again, the, paint, the patron, King Charles, is he knows it's a global industry. And you, I think you mentioned to us last night, Nicholas, that the number of events that he's done over the years of the campaign yes. are not just in the UK, are they? They've been Very much over. not. Um, he's been a great backer of anything that's to do with the Commonwealth and indeed beyond. Mm. He's been to, he went to, um, we had to organize for him to go to a sheep farm in Uruguay. So, I mean, there's no end yeah. to his interest <laughs> in it. In this country, I think in the 14 years of the campaign, um, the king has been to certainly 30 plus farms, businesses, mm. manufacturers, factories, um, uh, he's been in the British Wool Board in Bradford, we've been in Wales, we've mm. been in Cambridge, we've mm. been all over, the, mm. all over the place. But when he goes to Australia, um, he knows that the Australian wool farmers, sheep farmers, very, very much appreciate the, his passion for yes. it. Yes. You know, there they are. He flies out and lands in a sheep station in the middle of... Australia mm. and people have come from other sheep stations around yeah. and he is so knowledgeable mm. on what they're doing and mm. he loves going into the fields and into the shearing sheds mm. and mm. into the things and discussing it and in New Zealand he mm. does that in Canada mm. he goes at least once a year and there's yes. always something he does for wool when he's there so I often think with the king if as a campaign we had to pay for a celebrity to talk up wool mm, as often mm, as he did. Mm. I can't even begin to imagine mm. what we would have to pay yeah. David Beckham <laughs> um, if he was going to be doing <laughs> that yeah. many things around yeah. the world. And yet, uh, and yet um, he does it, um, um, His Majesty does it because he really, really cares about it and yeah. is a sheep farmer himself. Yeah. So he knows, always knows the price of wool. Yeah. Saying whether and it's I, going up or down. I know what he said about the difference between the, being the Prince of Wales and, and being the king. I mean, that makes mm. all kinds of logical sense. But I, I believe he, he'll have to say things in a different way, of course. But I, I cannot believe that his interests will change. You know, he's oh, the, I can't he's believe the it same person. His interests yep. will remain the same. Yep. And, and, I think, and the industry will remain a globalized industry. But I think what's happening now as we've, as we've come through other really difficult influences on businesses over the last few years. I mean, Brexit was a huge challenge to a lot yeah. of businesses. Any, any of the uh, fabric makers in, in Lancashire or uh, the, the tailors here in London, you know, exporting products into the EU has been a massive challenge, but we've got through that. And then, of course, COVID came out of the blue yeah. and uh, hit us all you know, in a really difficult way. Uh, we had to close our factories down, to furlough our staff, uh, to get through, in, in our case, um, a reduction in, in the sales turnover in our business of 30%. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to survive that kind of challenge, but many of the businesses have, and again, we've come through that. And I Can think you tell us about the factory, for those who are listening who don't know, what have you actually got in Derbyshire? Mm. If we arrived and came through the gate, mm. what would we see in front of us? Well, we, we, we yeah, no gates, but we do have okay. a bridge. We have a bridge across the, <laughs> across, the, across the road, and you come under, and the, it says, John Smedley, 1784, on the bridge. So it's a big sort of signal that you've arrived. Um, but the factory's been there since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. um, built in, in 1784, uh, only 13 years after Richard Arkwright built his very, very first cotton spinning factory nearby. And uh, we've been there ever since, manufacturing, spinning first, and then starting to knit, and knitting garments which were initially uh, long underwear, so long johns, mm. and now more sort of outerwear garments, cardigans and shirts and pullovers. Uh, and, and really, generally speaking, doing the same thing that we've been doing for you know, nearly 200 years. And how many people place. are working there in total, if you include drivers and yeah, today, um, admin? Um, about 310 people working there, making, making the jumpers wholly in the UK yeah. uh, and exporting them all over the world. And, and, and if you think about sustainability issues, it's very interesting in living and working there because we've used every source of power that's ever been used by any business, starting with the water wheel. That's really? What, yes. 
And, and what are you using the, now? Have you now got some solar elements? Uh, about to. So you, yep. know, you start with a water wheel, you go to coal, of course, yes. the great driver of the Industrial Revolution, yep. and then you start to make your own coal gas from coal, and then oil is discovered in the Middle East, and we start to use oil, mm -hmm. and then natural gas is discovered in the North Sea, and we start to use natural gas, and we've come almost full circle in that our first solar panel installation on the roof of the factory uh, will take place in the next six months. So it's a very interesting, you know, there are so many sort of cycles coming full circle yeah. to address these issues, which we haven't addressed for so many decades. And that's, that's and just intent, one of Did you go straight to... there after education? Not at all. No, no, no. No, I, I am a member of the family that owns the business, yeah. but I worked in other, other, other businesses. And then you were drawn, that. the lure, the pull. Well, or maybe the push of the family was a little element. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's clearly worked. And what about you, Clary? How long have you worked? Um, I'm nine years in now at John Smedley, and I did come pretty much straight from university. This was my first job, and I've just been Were you really at art college? Or uh, yes, you? at Nottingham mm. Trent, uh -huh. by design. And I just think it's, um, it's been an incredible company to work for as a knitwear designer to actually be able to work within the factory. You know, I can go out on the shop floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse in some ways because <laughs> if there's something with a design that isn't quite right, we definitely hear about it from um, mm. the people involved with making it, but also yeah. it means that we can it's then change that. It's great it fun to make a lovely product. I yeah, mean, that's, I, mean I, I started out in banking selling money. Mm -hmm. I didn't really take to selling money, I have to say, because mm -hmm. money is quite a boring thing. But, mm. but when you can make a beautiful product, it, it really Which does mo motivate you. Yeah, mm -hmm. motivate you. Okay. Yeah. I think also just to be able to learn from the skills of the people on site. You know, it's just an incredible workforce of craftspeople. And then we can kind of learn from them and work with them to just keep building and improving our products. How many of you are there in the design part? Um, so we're a quite a small team actually, yep, that's there's good. Uh, three of us in design and then we've got a wider product development team. Yep. Um, technicians. And, uh, and are you a lifetime Derbyshire person? So I'm actually from the North East originally, but um, I've been, well, in the Midlands for quite some time now, so yeah, it definitely feels like home. To your point about whether the King will be able to be as outspoken on ecological matters now he is the King, I'm thinking that he probably won't be able to intervene at all politically, but I think his enthusiasm for these sustainability and ecology in all its different forms mm -hmm. is now so well known, mm -hmm. and, is so, and there is such a momentum behind it. But I was also thinking that the new Prince of Wales, mm -hmm. um, Prince William, Prince Duke of Cambridge, has inherited entirely this, um, this, uh, this passion for sustainability, which of course also came from the late Duke of Edinburgh. Mm. So actually they've had three generations of people who were before their time, and, and, and what a lot of good they must have done. But maybe a good way to end this discussion is to remember uh, the King gave a speech probably six years ago now about mm. the wonder of wool, and he came up with a line that I think is so good about how even if some of the greatest scientists, and I think he used the word boffins, <laughs> were to set about inventing a new fibre, mm -hmm. and they had a whole factory that spent years trying to invent one, they would almost certainly never be able to come up with something with the versatility um, and the biodegradability mm -hmm. and, the, and the naturalness mm -hmm. of wool that comes to us free because it grows on the back of sheep. Yeah. Um, it's not quite free, but it's, um, <laughs> but it's, it's there, yeah. and it's for our use. And if ever there was a time for wool, it is now when we're worrying slightly about the cost of energy, and I think people are probably, if they're sensible, are going to be wearing slightly thicker coats and mm. a, a, a jersey when mm. watching TV rather than a pair of pajamas or mm. something. Um, <laughs> then then um, the profit that is the king was mm. right there. And thanks to you, very, very much to you both for everything that you do for the, for the world of mm. wool and the amazing designs that you bring to it. Well, thank you very much. And I hope, I hope we will get the chance at some point to put one of these into the hands of, of the king himself because 
I doubt anybody's ever done that before from the sheep in his own... I, I <laughs> am quite sure that he would be only too thrilled to be able to, to wear one. His valets will be able to give you That's right. the correct size. Yes. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank, Thank you. you. Very fun Thanks, conversation. Larry.